Hello, welcome everybody. Welcome to our third day of the conference, Machine Learning in Science. We had already two days of very interesting talks and today is our third day, which also features lots of interesting presentation. Um, the first one by Manfred Klaassen, unfortunately, had to be cancelled in the last second. Um, and Philipp Behrens luckily jumped in and is going to give a presentation instead. And I'm going to introduce him in a second to those who don't know him. Um, but then later in the afternoon, we are also going to have Steffi Gigelka from the MIT. We have Bedata Boswami, who is one of the research group leaders in our cluster. And Igor Lezanovsky from the Department of Physics. And additionally, again, we have a couple of spotlight talks on the internal projects. So now I would like to start with the presentation by Philip. Um, as I said, uh, Manfred Klaassen couldn't make it today. So Philip, um, most of you have seen in him many times already during this conference, um, being the moderator of many sessions. Um, for those who don't know him yet, Philip is a professor for data science um, at the medical faculty. And he works on the intersection of neuroscience and data science. And today he's going to talk about uh, hybrid models of retinal circuits. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, it's a bit of a spontaneous jump in, so I don't, I, I won't say I'm, I'm very uh, happy that you invited me. Um, <clears throat> and um, my talk will kind of take up a theme that was discussed in, in the first day in the talks of uh, Kai Cranmer and Jakob Macke. Um, on fitting complex models in, in science. So while Kyle talked about complex models in physics, um, I will talk about reasonably complex models in neuroscience. So understanding the universe and understanding the brain. Um, before I start, I would like to take a, a small step back and ask a more general question. So why do we use models in science at all? What's the, what's the purpose of modeling? Well, if you think about that a bit, I think what we try to do with models is that we try to summarize our understanding of the system in question. So for me, that would be trying to understand our, uh, trying to summarize our understanding of a, of a neuron or of a particular brain area. And in addition, we um, use models to create predictions to, to test that understanding. So only if we make predictions about, um, about new, um, new phenomena, um, then we can really um, say we may have understood something about how the system works. In neuroscience, we use um, models on, on two levels. And um, Jakob Macke uh, on, Monday, uh, on Tuesday nicely introduced that distinction as well. So on the one hand, there are machine learning and statistical models. In neuroscience, these are often models um, such as uh, the one sketched here that model the relationship between a visual stimulus, in this case, these kind of colorful checkerboard patterns and uh, the neural activity of an individual neuron or a population of neurons through a statistical um, function. So in this case here, this would be just a, a linear, nonlinear um, model where this um, kind of stimulus frame is um, linearly multiplied or the dot product is taken between one of these stimulus frames and something called the receptive field of the neuron that describes where in space the neuron reacts to, um, to changes in, in light. Um, but these models are purely on a, on a phenomenal level, um, purely describing the statistical relationship between stimulus and neural activity. At the other end of the spectrum, there are mechanistic models. So very detailed, often biophysically inspired models that try to reproduce the biophysical mechanisms that are going on in the cells and maybe most famously um, the Hodgkin-Huxley type of, uh, of models that were introduced by, um, by them in the, in the late uh, 40s and in the 50s. Um, these describe really the physical processes that go on in a neuron and can be used to to really on a physical level test our understanding of the of the um, the mechanisms at play. So for example, here we have built such models of um, cells in the retina. And this is a, um, a, a dendritic branch of a horizontal cell that has been reconstructed at great detail um, using electron microscopy data sets. And um, we turn that into a biophysical model by compartmentalizing it. And then in each of these compartments, um, there's a set of differential equations that describes the physical activity going on here. For example, the voltage or the calcium level. 
And then we can try to use such simulations to model how signal spreads in these cells and how things are computed on, on this kind of mechanistic level. Now, the machine learning models, by design, they are, they are made to predict neural activity well. Um, and they are often also relatively straightforward to fit to data. And they are very good at uh, doing what they're supposed to be doing. So machine learning models are really very successful at prediction. And um, here just one example to illustrate that. It's a study by Santiago Cadena, who's a PhD student in Matthias Bethke's lab, um, where they, they use a pre-trained um, VDG19 um, and the representations provided by such a deep neural network combined with linear readouts, a static nonlinearity, and some noise model to predict the spike counts of um, uh, neurons in the primary visual cortex. And when you compare different um, machine learning models, then um, these are really the kind of the state of the art in predicting the neural activity in that particular region and pretty much across all, all regions. And you can see that such a pre-trained VGG model almost explains about half of the explainable variance of these um, in the activity of these neurons, and that's about as as good as you can get. Now, um, as I said, they're very good at um, at predicting neural activity, and they are reasonably straightforward to test. But they're harder to interpret or harder to make sense of in. Um, when trying to understand the biological mechanisms at play. So biophysical models instead um, allow us to test causal mechanisms that are at work here. And at the same time, these are much harder to fit to data. So what we would want to obtain in the end is really the best of both worlds. So we would like to have neuron models that are as um, biophysically realistic as, uh, as needed to answer a certain question, right? We also always only need to go to a level that, that makes sense for the question we want to answer. Um, they allow parameter inference from relatively standard measurements. So um, many biophysical models traditionally require you to do very complicated experiments that um, specifically target individual parameters. So we don't want that. We want to be able to fit them from relatively standard stimulus response measurements. And um, in the end, we want these models to have um, actually a good predictive performance. And ideally, and this closes the, the loop to, to what Jakob and Kyle were saying on Monday, we would like to have a representation of the uncertainty about the parameters after inference, for example, to be able to detect parameters that are not constrained by the data or to detect dependencies in the, in the parameters um, and compensatory mechanisms as Jakob was talking about. What I will um, show you today is our recent advances into that direction. And I will do that um, in, in two case studies. So, and, and I call these models, so this is where the title comes from, I call these models that are somehow located between purely machine learning models of neurons and purely biophysical models of neurons, I call them hybrid models. So um, we are working in the, in the retina for the most part. The retina is the piece of the, the eye, it's a, a thin sheet of neural tissue at the back of the eye that takes up light signals from the environment and converts them into electrochemical signals. This is a process that starts in these cells called photoreceptors. These are relayed to the so-called bipolar cells um, where the information is modulated by interneurons called amacrine cells. These are here in, in orange and red. And then the result of these computations are forwarded to the ganglion cells, which send the signal to the brain. And the two models that I, I want to talk about today are a feed-forward model of the lin linear nonlinear processing in a single bipolar cell. And here we can actually do the uncertainty quantification that we would want to. And then in the, in the second part, a circuit model of all bipolar cell types, including amacrine cell feedback. And um, this is kind of where we are right now with this endeavor. So I will start with this first bit here. Um, this is the feed-forward pathway um, from the photoreceptors through the bipolar cells and then um, onto the ganglion cells. And basically, we would like to model the activity of these bipolar cells. The data we have to constrain these models come from a collaboration with uh, Ben James and Leon Lanardo at the University of Sussex. 
And um, they work in, uh, in zebrafish, where they can image the activity um, in individual bipolar cells using two photon microscopy. And this is such a bipolar cell. Here's the cell body. There are the dendrites. Uh, it's very blurry. And then here are the axon terminals. And these bright spots are um, spots where this neuron releases neurotransmitters. So the signal that the um, following cell takes up and does something with. <coughs> Um, they, they play um, a, a visual stimulus that is very simple. It's just flickering light, looking like this, and then measure neural activity, uh, which looks like that. And this neural activity trace that you can see here that comes in, in discrete um, amplitudes, and you can deconvolve that neural activity into um, estimates of the number of vesicles of neurotransmitter that were actually released um, by the, by the synapse at that particular moment. So here, after that um, step from light to dark, the cell releases about six vesicles of neurotransmitter. And then for this step here, after a lot of flicker in the past, the cell only releases maybe two um, vesicles here. They have studied that extensively and a, a paper describing that data set is available also um, online. Now, what we did with this data is we developed a model um, that uh, is a, we call a linear, nonlinear release model. So we summarize, we summarize actually most of the processing going on on the dendrites of the bipolar cells and in the photoreceptors um, and on the, in the cell body and so on. We summarize that with a linear filter. Um, and the output of that linear filter, um, you can think of it as the calcium internal in that cell. And this calcium is passed through nonlinearity to drive the synaptic release from that neuron. And the bipolar cells have a very specific, um, a very specific uh, synapse um, that is responsible for the release. And it's called a ribbon synapse. And that's a, a special type of synapse because it has this structure called ribbon um, and consists of three pools of vesicles. Um, one pool is the so-called uh, readily releasable pool. These are the vesicles that are docked to the membrane and can be immediately released. Then they are on the ribbon. It's, you can think of it as a, as a kind of a conveyor belt. Um, on the ribbon, there's the intermediate pool, that uh, the vesicles that get transported um, to the release site. They are kind of the intermediate pool. And then there's the... Um, there's the reserve pool um, of vesicles that are um, in the cytoplasm and can be docked to the ribbon to be then later released. And you can describe the movements of these vesicles here also with a stochastic set of um, differential equations. And I don't, uh, here also you can see an electron microscopy image of this, um, this structure with um, here some, some uh, vesicles in the release pool, readily releasable pool marked, and then some vesicles docked to the ribbon marked. I won't go through all the, the mathematical details of our ribbon model, um, but uh, we model first the correlated vesicle release with a better binomial distribution that allows to model also correlations in that um, release. Um, then the um, movement of vesicles to the dog. So this process here from this intermediate pool to the, to the membrane dock um, with the binomial distributions and then the movement of vesicles to the ribbon um, again, uh, because the, the, uh, this reserve is, 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 uh, is very large, um, we model that as well. And this stochastic um, model, we can forward simulate very easily. So if we set our parameters to some value, we can very easily generate forward simulations. But, it's, but there's no closed form solution um, for these parameters given some measured data. And this is where likelihood free Bayesian inference comes in or simulation based inference comes in, as was discussed by um, Kyle and Jakob on uh, Tuesday. So, what we want is a posterior over our model parameters given the data. And we, by Bayes' rule, um, we can get that um, by multiplying the likelihood and the prior. But the problem is that for such simulation-based um, systems, we cannot easily evaluate the likelihood. And what we do is we re resort to these techniques that Kyle and Jakob introduced, 
and we generate um, samples from a prior, so here in blue, sample some um, parameter set. We evaluate the model um, and generate a forward simulation. We compare, uh, we extract some summary statistics. So for example, the um, number of vesicles being released, the statistics of the vesicles being released and so on. We extract these summary statistics, and then we compare the summary statistics of our simulation um, with a set of data that we have measured, and we evaluate a loss function. We accept the best parameters, and then update our posterior and do that in a in a relatively fast loop. Okay, so how well does our model do? Um, this is the data trace. Um, it's it, we can see that our estimates of our parameters in the model that this um, converges relatively quickly, also to, to reasonable values. And when we generate simulations from, from the model with these posterior um, values, um, these look like this. Um, it's, it's hard to compare how good this is or bad this is um, visually. We also evaluate uh, our loss function here. And we also compare to a simple um, GLM type model that just does a linear, nonlinear processing of the data. And you can see that our model is quite a bit better. And importantly, we also capture other aspects of the data, for example, like the number of vesicles released at any given point in time. Um, our model um, also predicts properties of the data that are not used for fitting. So for example, um, the number of vesicles released correlates um, with a temporal jitter, so with a temporal precision of the of the release events, and this is also captured in the model. And um, when you um, stimulate the model with a with a pulse of activity, then this kind of cumulative release curve, this is something that has also been measured experimentally, looks a lot like um, what is known from experiments. We can also use the same basic machinery to do Bayesian inference for a really much more um, complicated model, a multi-compartment model of a, of a neuron where we have um, a, a much higher number of parameters, more than 20. This is really like a biophysically realistic model, as realistic as they can get. Um, and here the, the main issue is that there are the scattered knowledge of many of the parameters that are needed um, for such a model throughout the, the literature in different animals and different bipolar cell types and so on. And we can use these in this framework very nicely to set the priors of our inference procedure and then still use the data to constrain the model further. If you're interested in that work, it's available as a preprint on BioArchive. Okay, so now I showed you our first model um, a feed-forward linear nonlinear release model with a stochastic release mechanism of a single bipolar cell and how we fit that to data. Um, the second model that I would like to talk about is a circuit model of all bipolar cell types, including amacrine cell feedback. So why is that important? These amacrine cells here, so these interneurons of the inner retina, they receive feed-forward input from the bipolar cells and at the same time provide feedback input to the bipolar cells. And this feedback that decorrelates the different bipolar cells. And this is a collaboration, long-standing collaboration with the lab of Thomas Euler and Katrin Franke. The stimulus that was used to generate these data traces here is this. It's a light step in the beginning and then um, a flicker increasing in temporal frequency and a flicker increasing in contrast. And you can see when you compare the um, the result and the stimulus was shown in, in two sizes, once only stimulating very locally and once um, with a very big um, uh, big stimulus aperture. And when you compare all the local um, stim uh, traces here to the local stimulation, then you can see that all the off cells look roughly the same and all the on cells look roughly the same. And this is also something that we can quantify across all the different cell types. So in the mouse, there's 14 different cell types of, of bipolar cells, and um, these are all very highly correlated if only a local stimulus is used. When you use a, a bigger stimulus, um, these cells become decorrelated, so the values here are much smaller. Um, and you can also see that here in the example traces. So amacrine cells really play an important role in the processing of temporal information in the retina. 
the bipolar cell network model that we that we built um, essentially consists of a similar feedforward pathway model um, as we have used uh, before here of the vertical pathway. It has a slightly simplified release model because we don't assume it to be stochastic. Um, but in addition, it has feedback of two kinds of amacrine cell populations. One of them are local amacrine cells that provide inhibition to the bipolar cells and also to the global amacrine cells. And these global amacrine cells also again provide um, feedback to the inhibition and they are only activated by larger stimuli. This is joint work by Cornelius Schröder and David Klint, which is currently also under review and available as a preprint. Now, in the um, interest of time, I won't go through all the details of the of the model, but um, you can see here that we model the um, release drive as um, a function of the input from other bipolar cells. Uh, of the input of the bipolar cell and the um, local and global feedback. Then we also have this kind of release mechanism as we had before. And for the amacrine cell feedback, um, we approximate that um, with linear nonlinear functions. So we integrate all the, all the input. We have a, a temporal processing kernel. And then um, we use these signals to compute the, the local and global input to the um, uh, to the bipolar cell. So this is the kind of the feedback input. And this entire model is implemented in, in PyTorch and we also do inference in type PyTorch via um, gradient descent. Now we fit this this model to a set of stimuli to a set of responses to stimuli like you just saw this kind of chirp stimulus that we that we uh, uh, used quite a bit to classify different cell types in the retina as well. So this light step and with a um, modulation in um, temporal frequency and in contrast. And um, our model is able to, to fit this data well. So I show you here some uh, some fits on the, on the training set. So this is not particularly surprising, you could say. But if you compare that to a simple model, just a, 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 a linear, nonlinear model, that doesn't have this kind of feedback mechanism and doesn't have the release mechanism, then um, you can see that it doesn't, this, this more simple model doesn't fit these transients uh, very well here or um, also fails to capture lots of this um, other structure in the activity. The, on the, so this is the straw man model, if you want. And then on the other side, we compare our um, network model um, to an LSTM that has as many parameters as our network model. You can see that on the, on the training set, the LSTM actually fits the data almost perfectly, um, even better than our model. We evaluate the test performance on several data sets, but one of them is a, and I'll show you results for one of those um, here. One, it's a data set recorded using natural movies. And we just um, average the um, brightness values in these natural movies locally to a single um, dimensional, um, to a one dimensional stimulus that is, has, shows just variation in time. You can kind of think of that as the, the local contrast in the receptive field of the norms. Um, these are here example traces. You can see that this fit is not as good as on the, on the training data. It's also much harder. Um, to predict the activity to that um, to that stimulus because it's it's not averages over many repetitions and it's much more unstructured stimulus. But when we compare the correlations of the predictions with the um, recordings for the LN model and our model, we are really much better. And even for the LSTM, our model is, um, is somewhat better. And uh, interestingly, when you look at the, the numerical values um, and the interesting part is this here on the right, then our um, much more constrained and, um, and biology inspired model is always as good or even better than the LSTM model in predicting the activity of this um, bipolar cell activity to, to new stimuli. Now, this is not only about prediction. We said we also want to be able to, to test biological function or biophysical um, mechanisms. 
And for example, what we can do is we can use the model to replicate the effect of pharmacological experiments. So when you apply a drug called strychnine to, the, to this network, then you take out the local endocrine cells and um, this has an effect on the neural activity in the circuit. So um, you can see how this gray trace changes from here to here. And this is also replicated in our model, despite the fact that we did not put that in at all to constrain the model. We can also show that quantitatively. We can uh, also look at the connectivity matrix um, that the model has learned. And I'm just showing you the kind of aggregated connectivity matrix here. So this is the connectivity between off and on bipolar cells and then local amacrine cells and global amacrine cells also separated in on, uh, off and on uh, subgroups. And this is the connectivity matrix as learned by our model. And this is the connectivity matrix extracted from an um, electron microscopy data set. And you can see that, that many of the general patterns um, are reasonably captured by our model. And finally, we can create a really a biophysical level prediction from our model. And um, this is in how far the, the different bipolar cell types, how they differ. So if we look at the two parameters of this synaptic release mechanism, the uh, capacity of the readily releasable pool, so this number of vesicles that um, can be docked to the ribbon and quickly released, and the transfer rate of vesicles to this pool, then um, the different cell types uh, here in different colors, they show really quite different parameter regimes. This has not been measured experimentally so far, but in principle, it's possible. So this is really a um, kind of a, a mechanistic hypothesis that we can put forward and, and test in data. And uh, what is the, the function of, of these parameters? So basically the the transients of the response to, to the visual stimuli depends on, on this pool capacity. And with that, I would like to come to an end. And um, so uh, I've shown you two models that sort of try to form a hybrid between purely predictive models of retinal activity and mechanistic models of retinal activity with lots of biophysical detail. In the first one, we approximated the activity of single bipolar cells and the processing going on with a linear nonlinear release model and also performed uncertainty quantification. In the second one, we built a biology-inspired circuit model of all bipolar cell types, including amacrine cell um, feedback and fit that to data. So here, the number of parameters is too large to use this kind of Bayesian inference techniques um, from uh, simulation-based inference, at least right now. Um, but I think it would be interesting to explore how one can test um, ideas about which parameters are correlated and so on here also in the future. And with that, I would like to thank my entire lab, especially here, um, we fe I featured the, the work of Cornelius Schroeder and um, also our collaborators with uh, out whom um, this kind of work wouldn't be possible because we all obviously depend on the experimental data as well. And uh, finally, also, of course, thanks to all the people who, who pay for this kind of work. OK, thanks very, very much for your presentation. Um, I have already a couple of questions in the question box for everybody else. Please keep on typing your questions. I try to read them um, as you type them and then try to ask them. So the first question I'd like to ask um, is a question about um, more or less the contents of your model, not so much the machine learning part. So the question is um, by Arne Rolf, a very good question about the first model. How significant expressive do you think is this model for other retinal systems? Is it possible to use the model to learn other processes, perhaps by transfer learning, or even to explain data from other measurements like mouse and so on? I, there was one word that got eaten by the acoustics in the in the first part of the question. So the transfer to what? Uh, the trend. The trend. Perhaps by transfer learning. That's what it says. So essentially, I think the question is um, whether you can use this uh, similarly similar models for other retinal systems. 
Ah, okay. Yeah, this was basically fit. So the, the first model was fit to this fish data, and um, we also weren't quite sure, um, you know, how well it would work on, on mouse data as well, for example. And this worked really surprisingly well. So basically, that was plug and play. I think you multiply some constant by a factor of two, roughly, and then you have your mouse model. Um, probably a function of body temperature or something like that. Um, so, and the, the model that we used in the second part really is, is a deterministic version where we basically just take the stochasticity out of the synapse model. So the, these, these in, in, in principle, these, these ribbons and the dynamics which will, of these pools, they are really also relevant in, in lots of other systems. So in, in hair cells, for example, in your ear, you also have these, um, these kind of ribbon synapses. Um, they come in, in, in really various different flavors with the, you know, the size and the shape of the ribbon is different, but it, it seems like the, um, the general dynamics governing the activity, um, they are, are, still, are still the same. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then um, I, I have a question myself, which I've been wondering the last two days already. Um, so when I look at this um, this whole approach, so you start with um, some model, you do forward modeling, and then you come up with a summary statistics on which you evaluate the model, and then you compare, and then you compare the, like the simulated data to, to some true data and try to fit the parameters or so. My feeling would be that the results depend a lot on what summary statistics mm -hmm. use. Um, and if you choose a different summary statistics, it might be that you identify completely different model parameters. And of course, I mean, I'm sure you can construct such examples in theory, but maybe the mm -hmm. question is whether this would also happen in practice, whether you've observed that. So in, I think in, in some way, these summary statistics um, or having, having to specify the summary statistics explicitly, I think is, is in, in, on, on some level, I think it's actually a very nice property um, because it requires you to be specific about what features you think the simulation should capture. So if, if you um, just, let's say, take the mean squared error between your recorded trace and the, the fitted trace, then um, you can, um, by the way, you can do that as well, right? You can use a summary statistic that is just a mean squared error, but you can also do something more specific. So it, it doesn't prevent you from doing um, uh, doing basically very classical things as well. I think there's also some literature recently um, on, um, uh, on simulation-based inference techniques that try to learn optimal summary statistics, but I'm not terribly familiar with that. Mm -hmm. Because the question is also then if you want to evaluate your results in the or not, well mm -hmm. not evaluate but interpret your results in the end, right? So if somehow you chose a summary statistics um, and you get one kind of model and you choose a different one and you get a different model, then somehow it's hard to to interpret. I mean beyond that, your model is able to do predictions maybe, but other than that, it's difficult. Um, <laughs> Well, unless there are some meta level, um, unless there are some meta level arguments for why one set of summary statistics should be more meaningful than the other. Okay, I have yet another question here, um, which is whether the flexibility in terms of fitting arbitrary data of the BCN is smaller. Hang on, uh, of the BCN. Yeah, this, the, is, the, is the flexibility of the BCN smaller than the LSTM, even if they have the same number of parameters? I'm not sure I really understand the question. So, um, I, I think I know what the, the person is getting at. So the this, the second model, this, this bipolar cell network model, this overfit to some extent less to the data than um, the LSTM with a matched number of parameters. And um now it's i guess it's it's possible that by the way the model was constructed so we put in some inductive biases right we put in the knowledge about these respective cell classes and um we constrained the non-linearities non in certain places and and which kind of paths the information can take through the model and i guess in some way that could restrict the kind of capacity to fit individual thing uh, in arbitrary um data so maybe one could 
do some kind of capacity analysis um, on that. But in the in the other direction, I would say I don't really care as long as the true general or the the, the, gen, the, the generalization um, performance that we find to really data sets that the model has never seen. Um, the test I think we are here doing is, is even something stronger than a, than a standard test set, um, as you would do in, in computer vision, for example, um, because the, the model really has to work on data that where the stimuli have very different statistics from the stimuli used to, to fit the data during training. So I think it's, it's even a bit a stronger um, property that is being tested than just um, IID generalization error. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks a lot. So currently we don't have any more questions. Um, my suggestion is that we, that we take a, a small break and our spotlight session is supposed to start at 2.50, so in 13 minutes, so everybody just get a quick coffee and then be back at 2.50 2 and then we listen to our spotlight presentations. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks as well. <laughs>